God created this for man. Man created this for God. Community Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfort, Indiana. Come, join us. Let's pray. God, we think of the bloodshed over in Ukraine right now. It hurts our heart. But this morning after we worshiped and brought to you awareness from our heart that you have died to make us holy, that bloodshed becomes something so important. God, you didn't die on a cross to make us comfortable. You died on a cross to make us holy. I pray that we've gotten the message that the holiness that has been given to us is a treasure from the Creator who made a way. So as we bring together your holiness, I'm sorry, but it's full of human bodies and mistakes and brokenness. Teach us, please. Teach us to know the treasure we have in you, Christ, in the expression the Holy Spirit brings to our hearts. Draw us together as we watch this world fall apart so that on our world we can be a light in the darkness as we leave this building, as we comfort one another while we're here, and as we grow one day closer to home. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you had a really good preacher, he could finish a sermon on time. If you had a really good preacher, it wouldn't take him two Sundays to preach over one little simple text. But sometimes it, we miss the treasures that are beneath our nose. And I feel like maybe I missed this for a long, long time before I studied it deeper. And there's still, every time I go back to this first miracle that John recorded of the seven that he's going to tell us about, as I look at these red letters here of Jesus' words speaking, they're speaking for liberty for me. I'm connected to what's being said on these pages you hold in your hand. When we open the scripture today, we're going to open right to the passage I read last week, and I'm going to read it again this week, so that regardless of how good or how bad Mike is, the scripture's fantastic. The second chapter starts off here, and the, we remember this is about the third day into uh, a, a picture of these people walking on our earth, like us, wondering what this Jesus is all about. John the Baptist had said, hey, here comes the one who comes to take away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God. And boy, to the Jewish mind, that was a picture. Remember, we talked about symbols and signs last week. And one of those symbols is the Lamb of God. The very communion we partook of this morning reminds us of the blood of the Lamb that was put over the doorpost all the way back in Egypt when people were in captivity. We celebrate that today. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. That meant that all three of the followers that Jesus had at that time were right there with him. They were the witnesses, but they didn't know Jesus was taking them to school. They were going to learn something really important. Verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother asked him, they have no more wine. Jesus said, woman, I like that. It was actually a term of respect in that day. Woman, why have you involved me? And if we were to say it to each other in English, it would probably sound like, mom, why am I supposed to be interested in this? It's not my problem. Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. And we talked last week that the hour Jesus was come, when he would come out, when everyone would see him would be on the cross. But if he started too soon, as he knew what the right time was, he might not get to the cross because there were people that wanted to kill him all the way through his ministry. He had to time this thing out with God's timing, not the human kind that we have. An incident and it turns everything around. This is something important. His mother said to the servants, 
Let's say this together. Do whatever he tells you. Mary's last words we record in Scripture. Boy, they're good words for today. Nearby stood six stone, stone pots of water, stone jars. They were used by the Jews for ceremonial cleaning, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Remember, these stone pots were very precious and very important. And uh, the pots were filled with water, which must meant that they weren't full to start with. We're going to study that a little bit which meant there were a lot of dirty hands there because this was a, the wedding feast was a ceremony and it was a worship ceremony and they had to have a priest there to pour hands, pour water over all their hands. This was an admission of I'm dirty, I've done wrong deeds, I've disobeyed the law and the law to them was in the Torah, the Ten Commandments, those and then the, the other 600 laws that they had made up by this time. So the pots were pretty empty because there were a lot of dirty hands there. If we were to have a pot at the door, or six pots at the door, would that be enough for you guys? When you, I got out of there, you'd still need six more pots of water. So anyway, they, stone for the, uh, they were there for the ceremonial washing and hold from 20 to 30 gallons. In verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Now today we're going to do a lot of study about who these servants are and what was special about this. So they filled them to the brim. They were obeying what Mary told the servants to do, to do whatever Jesus told them. So they went, filled the jars. And they took them. Now, draw some water, take it out, and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Though the servant who had drawn the water knew, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests are too drunk. I put that part in. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. It's at a wedding that we find the inauguration of who Jesus is. It's his coming out party. And you may say, why in the world would you pick a wedding? Those are ordinary. We wanted a king and a parade, and we wanted all this excitement to go on. I mean, the king of the Jews, the Messiah, has come. But there were some problems with that. And Jesus decides to come and reveal himself to three people who would later turn the world around, Peter, James, and John. We read about them a little later, don't we? They needed to be convinced because, you see, they'd just been regular, everyday folk. In fact, very ordinary people, fishermen, laborers, people that did just like what we do on a daily basis. But they were going to go to school that day, and Jesus was going to teach them. It was a place and a wedding was something of a ceremony, but what we know about that is like with all of our relationships that come to a point of a marriage, there's a time, there's a place, there are witnesses. So Jesus wasn't coming in the dark of nowhere. He was coming to where people would really see who he is. Now we, we pretty much went over that last week. But today, we wanna get a little deeper there's a miracle that happens of changing the water to what? Hey, you're still awake. <laughs> but there's a greater miracle that's happening in these disciples that are following Jesus. He was changing ordinary into something really special. As I read through this, water turned to wine, ordinary turned to something better as the master of the, of the wedding decided and called it and we wanted to study a little bit about what was bringing this to bear. We talked a little bit last week about this thing called dispensation, when God dispensed himself to people. And that would happen in different ways through, down through the ages. And it had come through the prophets and through the Old Testament scripture. But now something was going to change. God was going to dispense himself through Jesus for this time he's on the earth and so this is a different time 
And when we get through with this period, we'll see that the power of God is going to be dispensed through the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. All three of those things have to be there. Now that's some pretty heavy duty teaching about why we're here today and what we're doing here in our worship. The overall application of these events from the standpoint of an opportunity at a wedding feast are arguable. Was a wedding the best place that Jesus could initiate his ministry and come out in, in such a way? Was it the best place? One of the things I think you need to see is that God stoops to whatever our ordinary is to meet us. Do you ever think in your, in your walk with God, you know, I'm not the special kind. I can't get up and talk on Sunday. I can't teach a Sunday school lesson. I can't even really sing a song that's pretty and make someone else want to hear it. Jesus showed up at our everyday life in this picture with what was happening in our world. You would think a God of the universe would flash the lights of heaven and go, hey, pay attention here. I'm important. But Jesus came as a servant. He initiated his ministry by meeting a need that was there in people's life. He used the situation. You know, many of you may sit out there today and say, I've never led anybody to Christ. I've never done any of those wonderful things. Maybe you're not catching on here. It is not in those big events that you're going to dispense Christ. Uh, Billy Graham's not here anymore. But for you and me, it might come in that quiet time off to the side of the main show for God to work through us. How many of you know how to lead someone else? Oh, don't raise your hand. I don't want to see that. How many of you know how to lead someone else to Christ? Oh, well, uh, uh, let me see if I remember all those verses. That's not where I am. The way God has given us is to use the circumstance we're in to show Him for who He is. That means tell your own story. The first line of evangelism, the first line of outreach, in, in my mind, is not slamming people with a bunch of verses of Scripture. We used to do that back in the day. We'd take them down the, the path that we had gone. But you know what? I find today that in our world, the greatest thing is you telling what your story is. I was lost, and here's when I realized it. Here's what I did about it. And here's who I'm thankful for. And you leave enough of a footprint in that story that somebody, if they're ready, because God's the one that does the calling, you have never brought someone to Christ by yourself in your life. If it was, that's all it was. But he calls us. And when we hear that message, it might be through one of you here that you would go and talk to someone and God has prepared their hearts to hear. And all you have to do is share your story. I'm going to ask you to do this this week. I always try to ask you to do something. Find somebody and tell your story of how you became a Jesus follower. Would you do that this week, if it, even if it's your wife or husband? And here's, here's the goal, first of all, for you to identify. Here's how I and remember. And then the next thing is to sharpen that up so you don't take so long that the person loses interest. And ask yourself at the end of it, or ask the other person you've just told it to, now would you know what to do if you wanted to become a Christian? All I'm telling you is the, the method here is tell your story. Oh yeah, it helps if you can quote a verse of Scripture. It helps if you can cite uh, something that Jesus did in that. But the important part is to get the door open. In this... <clears throat> The scripture comes along and helps us. It helps us by giving us something inside us that changes. Water to wine. Ordinary to something special. He takes it to the head of the banquet, and the, ba head, the head of the banquet doesn't even know what's going on here. He just says, hey, usually wait till the people are drunk, and then you bring out the, the bad stuff. But you saved the good stuff till last. He didn't even know. Who was it that knew the story? The servants. 
In verse 11, in that passage that we read, it says that the disciples believed. They saw it. They got it. But there was also something else going on there. The servants, those who were willing to do what Jesus asked. I love it when the Holy Spirit kind of, hey, my dad used to do that. Still works. Ouch. When the Holy Spirit reminds us that he's alive in us and he's done something bigger in us than we can do by ourselves, it energizes me to go, it's real. It's not just a fakey thing. It's the Holy Spirit living in me that allowed me to be a part of what God is doing in creating something special, something better. There are a lot of people who come to church year after year after year thinking, okay, I got this, this thing, and they never feel anything. They don't even feel saved. They just feel safe for the better place they're going to. And they don't want any more of that. You see, what was happening here was a real problem. It was a real problem because not only was Jesus arriving on the scene, but the greater thing was the Jewish people were in the business of rejecting him. They were so busy fulfilling the law that they didn't see Jesus. Are there ever times when you come to church so busy with taking care of your committee or taking care of something you do at church that you sit down and you don't even worship? Well, that's what happens sometimes when we are so busy trying to do all the right stuff. You see, about being a Christian, it's more than doing, it's being. This morning, you brought a piece of Christ through the Holy Spirit in here, and we all join together. You are very important here this morning because of what you're being, not what you're doing. Did you ever notice we were made human beings? not human doings. Our works validate what we say we believe. But it isn't as if we go about doing things to say, now see there, that's what I am. When we come together and allow God to change us, it's important that we see that God is doing this in such a powerful way that other people can share in that as well. What is the difference between how the water changed by Christ in the New Covenant and Moses, hello, maybe that was somebody coming in. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You see, they were so busy taking care of the Old Covenant that they missed the new one. We can become so busy doing church that we forget to be a part of the body of Christ. You know, I celebrate that you and I are one in Christ. Yep, you, warts and all, because I got more than you got. And when we come together, something wonderful happens. The change comes, and we become that water-to-wine experience to our community. You know the churches that, that come to church every Sunday and let the rest of the world outside go to hell? I don't want to be a part of those churches. I want to be a part of a church that comes together and we love each other so much and we love Jesus so much that we have a fragrance about us of God's Spirit in us and we have that that ambiance of fine wine that's better than anything. You see, there are a lot of people who are getting along in life just fine without having the Jesus part. But if we show them that we have a life that that is so blessed, and we have so many blessings of who we are and what we are, they may look at us and see something different. Those servants saw the change that not even the head table, which was to represent in the symbolism the Jewish world at that time, that had rejected and had no idea this Jesus coming was going to change us. The miracle of salvation only comes to each individual when we do as Jesus has said to do. There's a passage that says this happens by the washing of the word. When we let God's word get inside of us, things change. If you can't tell you're any different since you became a Christian to what you are now, I'm gonna tell you, brother or sister, there's something not right. It would say, in my mind, there's an absence of God's presence in you. There's some place, either there's sin in your life that's blocking you from God, not God from you, 
or the Holy Spirit has not really made the change of changing the water into something better, that regular you into something better. We have such a message to give to the world. I, I want to go to some practical things now to talk about this. We look at the two groups that are represented here in this wedding. The old Jewish religion who were chasing after the law, fulfilling the law, doing the worship stuff. These people were eaten up with that. They even stood on street corners and showed people how pure they were to their religion and yet walked on by. The servant was there in this picture as something to give us a a picture of those that have acted on God's Word. In other words, have you ever read a scripture and been pricked in your heart or touched in your heart that you need to do something? You ever uh, gotten really mad or crossways with somebody and you just wish they'd go to um, Lafayette? <laughs> I didn't even know that was funny. <laughs> it's important for us to see that God can change us. That scripture comes to mind then that we are to love instead of hate. You know, we underestimate this all the time. You know why churches aren't full today? It's because we're full of church buildings and fancy programs and sinning people. We all are. They've, they've kind of gotten in on what church is supposed to look like instead of the change that happens internally from the water to the wine. Can you look at me? Can you sit down and have a conversation with me about what changed about you? Man, I could tell you, here's what I have been. And here's what I am now. All by the grace of God. The servants saw this change. They literally acted upon the fact that that Jesus said, go fill these pots. There are times that we just need to have honest, straightforward obedience to whatever Jesus asks us to do. Love our enemies. When we get down to the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to get really a, a deep lesson in what Jesus asks you to do. Where is it in your life you can point out right now that you're doing what Jesus asked you to do? The primary work of the servants was reflected in they did what was expected of a servant to do what we're told to do. Now, would you like to be the head of the table? That's the way the world looks at it. I'm a somebody important. Or would you rather be one who had the favor of God? You see, the servant found themselves to be so blessed because they were revealed what was great about the water. God's Word changes in us, but it doesn't happen as some, some It changes as we let the Word take place in our life. People are not saved by programs or enthusiasm or entertainment or reflections or being seeker sensitive or the new thing of being woke sensitive. It is when God's Word takes place in us that we find rest from what we're supposed to do and how much we're supposed to do, but it's also where we find effectiveness. What we might glean from the, the fact that these servants knew that the wine came from the water is because they can tell you that God can change you too. Maybe that's our most important message to the Frankfurt community. Hey, I was just water, but now there's something special in me. Do you want some of it? I'm sure the drug dealers in town are peddling about the same message, but theirs only last temporary, like this story. Their cleansing through the pots of water only lasted just a little bit, but it wasn't a real change because they were going to go right back out and dirty their hands up with sin again. As I bring you down to the end of this, if I could take you back to, to Romans, it would talk to you about a stumbling block that the Jews were going to have. And the stumbling block was that they were hearers of the word and doers of ritual, 
but they'd missed the relationship part. And Jesus had been right there in their midst. You could come to church all your life. You could be one of the uh, elders I'm gonna pick on you. You could be one of the elders of this church and be very satisfied and very fulfilled doing the things that religious people do, but you're still just water. It's when the Holy Spirit takes up residence. The Holy Spirit is one of those places where it talks about that powerful, powerful change in your life and it talks about it as water that cleanses us. I want to take you to a story real quick. In Matthew 25, do you want to go back there with me? This kind of finishes up the sermon, so that could get you excited. Since we talk about this being a forerunner to the, the wedding supper of the Lamb that's in Revelation 19, verse 7, and talks about the end times and how it's going to be a beautiful ceremony, and this wedding will be remembered by all of us in heaven as we studied in the Scripture at that wedding feast of the Lamb that it talks about. But when you get down to the um, passages here in the end of Matthew, what are you talking about? You're talking about the return of Christ and how he's talking to us about the end times. I want to take this apart just a little bit. Verse 25, starting with verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take oil with them. Let me give you the picture. There had been probably in that day the, the bride's groom, the, 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 the bridegroom was going to come and it was the virgins in this or those friends of the bride that were going to prepare the way for the bridegroom to come. And they would have these, uh, they weren't like little lamps, that wouldn't have made much sense. But they were a, a stick that had uh, little pieces of cloth wrapped around them that had been dipped in oil. And they would burn, and, and they would burn probably for just a few minutes, and then they had to have a, another uh, piece of uh, cloth that had been dipped in oil to put around that so it would continue to burn. So it would be burning bright when the bridegroom got there to see the bride. Verse 4, the wise ones, however, took oil in a jar along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. They used to like to play that game, make or wait. See, guys, life has changed. It's the other way around today. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to be wise, Give us some of your oil. And lamps, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you, in, uh, and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. Well, they knew that wasn't going to be something that would happen because by that time the bridegroom would come and they would have missed it. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were already went in with him and the, uh, to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day nor the hour. What's the significance of that wedding? The significance of that wedding is that there are going to be a lot of people who are paying attention to the wrong thing that miss getting to come into the wedding of the Lamb of God. That's heaven. When the church is joined with him, there's a lot more about this in, in Revelations. You can put it all together for yourself. But listen, there are a lot of people sitting in pews today that think they're ready for the bridegroom to come, Jesus. But that oil represents something. Remember we talked about signs and things that became significant. What does that oil represent? The Holy Spirit. If you're sitting today here in church and you cannot identify for me one place in the past week that the Holy Spirit has tugged on your heart, shown you someone in need, shown you your own sin, come speaking to you through Scripture, 
then if I were you, I'd be a little nervous about if the Lord returned today. Oh, but Mike, I've been through all the, the church stuff. I, I've even got a baptismal certificate. I, I can prove it to you. These attendants to the wedding thought they had everything. They had their stick. They had the, the pieces of cloth, but they forgot to bring the oil. Did you forget to bring the Holy Spirit here for you today? Did you forget to take him into the battles you had last week? Did you forget to stop and say, Lord, I'm not getting this. Holy Spirit, please come and be a part. Do you think God sent the Holy Spirit just so we could mumble to ourselves and, and, and have some other church split because of how we viewed the Holy Spirit? No. He sent it to empower us. These people represent so many today that have done church all their life. And if Jesus walked into their church, they'd probably ask him to leave because he probably wouldn't fit. When we're doing all the religious stuff, we can miss it so terribly. This fits when you come to church. It fits in your home. You know, if you don't take the Holy Spirit home with you, and ask him to give you the words to raise your children by, the way to set an example of how to treat a husband or a wife, or to your neighbor to show how you love that neighbor. They're never going to ask you about eternal life. They're never going to change. They're never going to hear the message. Because there's a lot of people who don't know God today who go to church. There's a book out right now called The Unsaved Christian. I'm not your judge. But if that's stuck in your heart and in your crawl, then you need to do something. Because just like the coming to the wedding, Jesus was trying to give a message through that whole thing to the Jewish people that you've missed. You've missed the right thing. I don't want to just bring confusion and doubt into your mind, but I do want to ask you this. If Jesus were to show up here today, would he be more important than doing church? Could we follow Mary's words and show anybody in our life, do what he says? I hope this brings some sense of conviction, but not conviction where you just go, oh, I'm dumb, I can't get all this. But conviction to say you're living beneath your privilege. The water has been turned to wine. It's you that has to partake. It's you that has to let Jesus come in and pour it into your life before you'll ever taste and see that he is good. So many of us push away doing church stuff because it's just another thing to add to an already uncontrolled, overburdened schedule. I think where we need to go back to is, Holy Spirit, what's most important? And let me make my schedule by that. We need to go back and say, do I really need this job if this job is going to take my Sundays, if this job is going to take me out of the, the focus of, of faith, if there's no way I can get around other Christians, could it mean that I need to change something I'm doing in my life? Maybe. Our world is a long way away from God. You look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, and I'm just surprised there's not more of that. This world's full of hate and full of people who are trying to grab power over somebody else. And yet here we stand and sit this morning celebrating the righteousness of God, and we find joy in our hearts while the world around this is pretty sick. We can't leave it that way. I'm not on a plane to Ukraine, but I'm looking for the next person who needs to win the greatest battle in life, and that's the one over self, the one that comes through the Word of God. Have you experienced that victory? Have you experienced the light-giving oil that burns in the Holy Spirit's illuminating of your life from the darkness of confusion? There is so much that is in that passage that's still there to be mined. <laughs> and if you want, I can give you another 20 minutes. It's all written down up here. But I cut that short to say this to you. The Jewish people missed Jesus. 
Isn't that awful? They'd studied and prepared to find the Messiah. All those books, all the religious effort and energy, they were looking for the Messiah. And just a few verses earlier, John says, they did not recognize him. Do you? If they don't recognize you, is it because, if you don't recognize what God's doing, it is because you're still trying to make your religion out of water? Or his touch in your life that turns it into something different? If you want a real test of this, go back to your worship this morning. How was it? Was it just church? Or was Jesus in it? Did you sense the oil of the burning of the Holy Spirit in your life? Oh, brothers and sisters, don't live beneath this. Don't just say, oh, don't bother me. I, I've got it figured out and that's all I want. When Jesus returns, your only agony might be that you didn't really worship him in spirit and in truth, that you didn't really get there when you had all these opportunities. But the saddest thing I would be afraid for you is that you've been all this time in church and those same words that he gave to those virgins would be your words, I never knew you. Let's pray. God, I'm listening because there are times in my own life where I, I shut out the Holy Spirit. I'd rather worry than trust. I don't let the Word cleanse me and energize me. I don't see these pictures. I, I, I just would rather go back to the pots and say, somebody wash my hands. Lord, forgive us when we as a church become satisfied. Forgive us when we don't love others enough to give them the new wine of a new life. Forgive us when we have held that all to ourselves like a secret. And forgive us when we have failed to be willing to drink fully of who you are. Holy Spirit, please come here and bring our words to a focus and a point. Do something in us so that we know it's you. Let us taste what is better. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Community Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfort, Indiana.